The Carter Cast, the pre-proposal show for dating couples designed to make engagement ring shopping easy, understandable, and fun. You can get the four C's anywhere, but only here can you get the fifth C called Carter. I'm Josh, and this is CGA GG, former president of the AGS, current Jack Lewis Jewelers CEO, and now 2024 Robert M. Shipley Award winner, yeah. John Carter. That, Welcome. That, that last part's got a nice ring to it, doesn't Tell it? Tell us a little bit uh, about winning the Shipley. What's that about? I, uh, it's been four months, and I still can't believe that that happened. That's uh, Winning a Shipley, my friends will ask me, like, what's that like? And, and I heard my wife, I think, was the first one I heard say it. She's like, it's, winning, it's like winning an Academy Award in the, in the jewelry industry. But the only difference is that you don't know you've been nominated. So you go to this luncheon full of your most respected peers and, and colleagues in, in your industry, and you're just there, I'm just there minding my business, having lunch, and all of a sudden they say your name. So now you, <laughs> so now you're emotional about this speech, this right this here. honor, and then you have to get up and you, no, I had right. no idea. I, I literally <laughs> even said I'm about to give the worst speech I've ever given because I was not prepared. So. And he did humbling. The very <laughs> did I did it was it was bad. I may even get no, into it was that great. Later. I saw it. Oh, it's it's the kind of thing you watch once though, and then you don't really. No, do. I haven't watched. You haven't it. watched it yet. I won't let myself watch it. Okay. No, because I don't feel like I did a very good job. Ah, you did. It because it, the, the moment is so huge and it is such an honor that I, I don't feel like I could have probably even lived up to it in my own mind. So what is it honoring? Like, what is the sense behind it? Uh, Robert Shipley is essentially the godfather of the American gemology movement. He founded both the Gemological Institute of America, or GIA, which we talk about, and the American Gem Society, which, as you know, I've been, as you mentioned, yep. I'm the past president and, and been involved for many years. Um, and they're really the two organizations that have uh, the most impact on our, our industry. They're, they're sort of the, the, the gemological guide and the conscience of our industry. So uh, it honors people who have dedicated their life in a service to the society, the American Gem Society, and our industry as a whole. So it's, uh, to, to be on that, that group of individuals is... It's so humbling. Yeah. Well, we might circle back to that a little yeah. bit later. But in the meantime, welcome into Thanks. the Carter Cast Studio. High atop the Illinois House Building in downtown Bloomington, Illinois. We are filming this at the end of August 2024, which means this episode will take us through the fall. Um, and since there's a very big day coming up this fall that is so important, uh, we decided to build this entire episode around it. And that day is... The presidential election. Yes. This is a politics episode. Oh. We're going to talk about every candidate. We're going to talk about every divisive I issue. I thought we had a rule, no politics. Oh, oh that's right. Yeah. yeah. Well, no one else is doing that anywhere, though. So I figured we <laughs> could just probably, fill a hole that wasn't being probably, covered. Probably good. That space is not crowded. Yeah, yeah. Uh, seriously, no. Th that date is Bears-Packers, November 17th at Soldier Field. That's oh. the important date that we're going we're gonna to talk about, about all that stuff. Yeah. Full out primer, all 32 teams. Bears. NFL preview show. Yeah. No, okay. yep. we won't do that either. Uh, for real, the monumental day uh, this fall is October 22nd, which is John Carter's 50th birthday. Um, you don't look a day over 52. Well, you, fit, you look about 50, I think. Maybe it's yeah. uh, about right. 40, 47. We'll give you 47. Knowing Something we like were that. talking about my 50th birthday, for some <laughs> reason, the uh, as I was getting ready this morning, the, the tune that's been stuck in my head all day is Touch of Grey. <laughs> by the Grateful Dead, uh -huh. which, you know, is yeah. fitting. And uh, it's, it's executive silver. But the depressing part of it is I was thinking about it and humming the tune as I was uh, getting ready to leave this morning was that when that song was released, Jerry Garcia was probably my age. <laughs> so I bet he was. I'd have to look that up. But I bet he was, you know, yeah. close to 50. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I looked up other notable people with October twenty oh. second birthdays. Oh, okay, good. I don't know many of them. Yeah, uh, Curly from the three the Three Stooges. Oh, that works. Nyuk, nyuk, nyuk. <laughs> yeah. Whoop, whoop, whoop. <laughs> the funny one. Yeah, the funny one. Yeah, that's sweetenly. Good. That's uh, he's, he's I your didn't soul know that. Uh, Christopher Lloyd, Doc oh. Doc Brown. Okay. From right. uh, Back yeah. to the Future. Yeah. Uh, Morty. Great Scott. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. That guy too. Okay. Uh, and of course, probably the most famous, Brian Boitano. Brian uh, Boitano. 1988 Olympic figure skating yeah, champion. Yeah, legend. Uh, what would Brian Boitano do yeah, if right. he were here right now? Right. He'd probably sing happy birthday to he'd me. He'd probably do a show or two. Yeah. That's what Brian Boitano would do. <laughs> well, well, well played South Park reference, Josh. <laughs> I knew you'd get that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Anyway, 
uh, given the milestone of Carter's 50th birthday, we thought it'd be a perfect opportunity to reflect back on 50 years of wisdom uh, with a big picture retrospective. What is Carter learned in 50 years of the jewelry business sort of episode? Mm-hmm. Um, highs, lows, day to day grind, uh, biggest challenges, managing different kinds of relationships, um, high level things that tap into philosophy and approach. Uh, principles, things customers might find helpful or relevant to know about how a jewelry store is run, uh, what goes on behind the scenes, how decisions are made that end up impacting them. So this episode is centered around the business of jewelry with a customer's perspective in mind, um, or even other entrepreneurs or small business owners Mm -hmm. in mind. Um, So if you're interested in what it's like being a small business owner, or what it's like owning a jewelry store in particular, this is the episode where we put on our jackets Uh, Take a 10,000 foot view and let Carter share his perspective on the business of running a jewelry store. Sound good? The business of business. The business of business. That's it. All right, let's dive in. So uh, you own a jewelry store. (laughs) Thank you for noticing. (laughs) (laughs) It is Jack Lewis Jewelers here in Bloomington, Illinois. Um, Jack Lewis Jewelers has existed since 1927. Uh, It's had three owners. Uh, Mr. Lewis himself, Mm -hmm. uh, John Woolwind, and you. Yes. Uh, Your tenure began in March 2011. So let's start in that 2009-2010 area. Okay. Um, You worked at the store for Mr. Woolwind. At some point, those discussions start happening about you potentially taking over. Yeah. Certainly working at a business is different from owning a business. So what made you want to own this jewelry store? Uh. The, those discuss, those discussions, the the preliminary ownership discussions happened when I years before that when I first came back to Jack Lewis. I think that probably would have been two thousand two in that in that neighborhood. Um, the that was always the plan because John, uh, who purchased a store from Mister Lewis, didn't have any children that wanted to be in the business, and so um, John had no children, and Jack Lewis had no children that were in the business. That's how it ended up in in John's hands. And John and I had known each other. You know, I had worked there in high school and stayed all through my time at at Illinois State. And so when I came back uh, in 2002, there was always that path to ownership. Mm -hmm. And I think that the uh, this this is one of the few times where I actually have read your email ahead of time, and I so I, I sent him the prep questions because this is like bigger yeah. stuff. So it, well, you know, and, and some of it is. Although the ironic part is, this is this should be the part of, of things that I know the best, <laughs> right? But I still wanted to. to so I was thinking yeah. about that again uh, this morning, and um, when when John had originally called me to come back and and uh, really interview for the position of of manager of the store mm-hmm. and, and and potential owner. Um, I had to really think about it. It was the jewelry store that I had grown up in, in the town that I grew up in, right? And at that time, I was living up north. And so the question is, why would I want to continue that on? Well, I think we'll probably get into some of that a little bit later, but this store serves a very special role in our community. It has meant a lot to me and meant a lot to John, I think, and certainly to Mr. Lewis, uh, to see that tradition carry on, to be here to, to celebrate memories and to have relationships in your community and give back and employ people mm-hmm. and uh, do good things. So why that store? Yeah. Uh, because it was intimately a part of me even at that time. Even the you know my first day when I was 15 years old, it meant a lot to me. Uh, and so to see that carry on now that <laughs> 35 years later yeah. uh, is, is really crucial. It's really important. Back then, what... Uh, you know, I just think about anybody who decides to take that big leap to to own a, a business. What what gave you the confidence then to think you'd be good at it back, back in in that period? But as you're talking about those discussions were going on, like what made you think you could do it well? Well, first of all, Josh, I'm good at everything. So <laughs> except golf, I'm not not I'm not good at golf. as much as you play golf. You should be better at it. I f- certainly should be. You would, the the, you the would gentleman think. I play with would probably agree with you. Um, no, there there. I, I'm kidding, of course, because the answer to that question is I didn't. Mm. I didn't. I think maybe you said, "Did I know? Did you? Did I think I would be good at it?" Yeah. What um, made you think you'd be successful? I thought I would be good at it. I certainly didn't know that I would be good at it mm. because it was a when I first came back in that at that time in 2002, I was I was uh, 25 years old probably and thrust into this position of managing other people, and I had never done that. That was the difficult part was was the HR side of things and learning how to lead and learning how to be a good example and how to hold yourself to a high standard and then expect other people to follow that and how to 
treat the customers with this with the uh, respect and the experience that we want to deliver every single time. That took really years for me to to cultivate that and learn that. And I dare I say, be confident in it because there's certainly something that I learn about all of those aspects of running a, a business yeah. every single day. As any business owner that would watch this would probably agree, you never really get to a point where you're totally good at it. Uh, you, you, you get to a point where you can be a competent leader, where hopefully you're an inspirational leader, where people want to be a part of what you've put together. Um, but at that point, did I know that I would be good at it? No. Did I feel like I had the potential inside of me if I surrounded myself with the right people to do it? Absolutely. And that's really was the key was the moment where I got past my, my, past my youthful arrogance where I thought I could do everything myself. And when I got to the realization that, no, you have certain holes in your abilities that, that you'll, you're not going to be developed because nobody's good at everything. So I had to surround myself with people who were excellent at X or really good at Y. Okay. And uh, that made all the difference in, yeah. in, in my world once I was able to get past that, that my own arrogance. Yeah. Now, we'll, we'll return to some of that when it comes to all the different people that have yeah. been involved. I, I'm curious, how might it be relevant or important to the customer to know about the ownership or the ownership history of, of a jewelry store? As the store gets to be close to 100 years, um, I always think that that's a really important milestone. Um, yeah. I'm not so certain that it matters to somebody when they walk in that mm. a store is 100 years old. Because I don't think people think in, in the, that term. I don't, I don't think that way when I walk into yeah. a business. I walk in wanting a good experience that day. Mm. Uh, but what's not appreciated when I walk into other businesses is the years that it took to create that experience when I walk through the front door. Yeah. And so for people to maybe know the history, it's interesting. I, I mean, but certain people are students of history and certain people aren't. You know me. Mm -hmm. I love history. Yeah. I love local history in particular. Uh, and I, I do, of course, love the history of my own business. I don't know that it's ever going to be impactful enough or a reason that somebody should shop with us. Mm -hmm. Um, but to know it and to know that the, the, the business has, has a long tradition in our town, in central Illinois, and draws from a long, long, long way away, I think that matters to people, I think, when they start to realize it. And, and I do get the uh, appreciative nod sometimes that, hey, the owner is here. Yeah. Uh, and, and so th there is an importance to that, knowing that it's not just some person in some faraway corporate headquarters. That matters. Yeah. But in terms of the, the history and the and the family tree, if you will, of the, of the business <laughs> right. probably isn't as, as important yeah. as it, as it maybe is to me. Yeah. Um, all right. So you've had a little over 13 years at the helm now. Um, as you reflect on that time, are there any key moments or decisions that represent clear turning points that would kind of allow you to break those 13 years down into certain eras or chunks or seasons? Like for example, the first few years were mostly about X, then this happened, and then this chunk of years was kind of Y. It, how would you kind of break it down in terms of seasons or eras? Well, remember, so I got, I don't know if you remember this, but I got married the year before yeah. we bought the business. And yeah. then I had our first child the year that we bought the business. Yeah. So within, you know, just a couple of months, That's right. I, I owned the business and then, and then our daughter was born. So, you know, my wife, Ketty and I like really, in which terms means of, she's 13 now, by the way, <laughs> I know. Yeah, she just, just turned. <laughs> Believe me, I get it. <laughs> um, she is insistent, by the way, yeah. that she comes on an episode of Carter Cast. Oh, really? She says she wants her own episode. So wow. I was quizzing her this morning about oh. what would she actually speak yeah. about. So Lila, if you're watching, and Leo also thinks that he should be on Carter Cast. <laughs> so when they see this, uh, they'll say, yeah, that's right. We're going to have a Lila Leo cast. I don't even think I'm allowed to be on that one. And yeah. quite frankly, I don't think you should be. No, 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 no. They'll, um, we'll just... But anyway, we'll, we'll do, the cameras just turn on. It'll be yeah. the two of them sitting here, and it'll be infinitely better than yeah. That. But I digress, which yeah. really is something we should say often on the Carter Cast, because um, <laughs> that's, that's not at all what you asked me. It is in terms of seasons. Yeah. some of that was like filtering. It's hard to separate the family life and your mm. personal life from how, and then also trying to grow and learn the business. But I, but I'll say this, and that and that if you're just, if it's just a business question, yeah. from that one of the most pivotal things. Uh, that I that that happened in that first season, if you will, uh, or in the first three four years, was uh, partnering with you. Oh, um, and that's not why you asked the question. No. But but again, <laughs> as I was prepping for this and thinking about that, that was a really pivotal moment because when Josh and I first 
got together. And we had known each other for years. I had I sold bought my you, ring from you. Yeah. Sold you your engagement ring. Yeah, yeah exactly. Back in 04. And you, you had started your own company around mm-hmm. the time that I was purchasing Jack Lewis. And I knew that we needed a new refresh, rebrand, relaunch for what it was that we did because we had, and not wrongly, but we had just relied on our heritage for so long yeah. that that something we needed to tell a little bit different story that still embraced that, didn't get away from it, but told a, a more updated version of that. So really that, um, I remember that first meeting that you and I had where you asked me these series of questions like, what would I want Jack Lewis to look like and feel like and be like? Mm-hmm. And then we had a follow-up meeting and you just did those things in, in the marketing. <laughs> and I knew yeah. that we had done a really good job in that initial meeting because when I played my first radio ad for my wife, she cried. And it was like, not because it was particularly even an emotional ad, it was a little bit of emotion to it, but because it was, it started to tell the story that we wanted to tell about our business and that I had felt like we needed to tell for quite a long time. Yeah. And so that season really then shifted for, for the next two, three years. You remember you and I really focused on, we wanted to be an engagement ring mm-hmm. store. We wanted to be more a part of people's engagements and love stories yeah. and things like that, rather than just anniversaries and things, which we still do. Mm-hmm. But we became a bridal store, um, uh, engagement ring store in a very short period of time. It really only yeah. took us a year or two to tell that story properly where, where we started to, to, to invite that, that, that group of clients to our store, a younger yeah. bridal, bridal uh, era um, mm-hmm. customer. Mm-hmm. And that was, that was really what I consider to be our first most important era. And then as we've shifted and grown the business, then, you know, God brings people into your life at the right time and as you need them. And some people that have worked with me, or as you know, I've had dozens and dozens of mentors, none of which I could even do justice by mentioning them uh, because I would forget many people. Um, but mentors come into your life at the right time. Employees come into your life at the right time. And then Missy came into our lives at the right time, who's, who's our, our general manager and, and, and business partner. That's kind of the one I was thinking of was like, yeah, that's a very pre Missy and post Missy. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> Some right. big <laughs> differences. Yeah. And it really a made way. a difference in our business. Yeah. And, uh, she, t- she was immediately, uh, as we got to know each other and work together and know each other's personalities. And I, again, like you, I had known her for many years. And um, it just was a good fit. And she's, she's got such a, a good eye and, and, and brought a, a level of expertise to merchandising that I just don't have. It, as I've told you before, it's very hard to buy jewelry when you're not a fashionable woman. <laughs> Missy is. <laughs> don't sell yourself short, man. I mean, you know. <laughs> I mean, I did the best I could for many years. Uh, but Missy really has made all the difference in the world. And when I have people come in and uh, I hear things that I would have never expected, like people are, your jewelry is so relevant. Hmm which is such an interesting thing for somebody to say. Hmm. Uh, but I've heard that a few times over the years. So, so bringing her, and then she takes so much else off my plate too in terms of just day-to-day operations. So that was a really key one. Um, my involvement in our industry, my, my American Gem Society involvement, which goes back really to the year before I bought the store that I've, that I've been on the AGS board, uh, has been pivotal, uh, pivotal um, in terms of just what I've learned from the people that I've had the privilege to be around. And and you see these people that you you hold up as uh, examples of what it is and what it means to carry yourself in our industry. That's been really key. And then now I think we get into uh, this new season, of course, which is exciting new growth. Which mm. uh, we, I, I don't. I, I didn't read your whole email, I, I, so I don't, I don't I know if there's any questions about there wasn't, that later. Okay. There wasn't. No. Um, but as we we build a new store, um, hey, hey, oh, breaking news! No, if you've driven <laughs> by around the time town, this airs, it will not. Be. Yeah, well, it's not now. <laughs> That's uh, true. There's a large yeah. structure over by uh, Biagi's and Ancho and Agave. Shout out to my neighbors. That's it. Uh, and uh, <laughs> as soon as we get into that, that really probably is the next season, and and what that new. Uh, brand and future yeah. of Jack Lewis Jewelers looks like. So that's a, a long, a weighty answer to your. Um, so at, at 13 years uh, leading it and then working in jewelry for longer, um, how are jewelry stores different today than at other points in your career? You know, back in the uh, 80s and 90s, inventory uh, management and purchasing is very different today than mm-hmm. it was back then. In those days, it was just there was certain there was very simple inventory rules. And it was like there was almost no limit on how much stores would spend and put in their cases. <laughs> and now everything is so analytical and driven by, you know, it's like the difference between baseball now than it was when we were a kid. It's all analytical. Batting right? average and RBIs. Yeah. So nope. you're so you're looking at <laughs> it's still about relationships. It's yeah. about relationships with our vendors and our clients and everybody, but it, it's it's also about 
uh, the sheer numbers of new lines and new categories that we bring into our store and how well does it do and what price points do we need to focus on? And so there's just, that's, that's a lot of, of, of Missy's role in our job is just hyper analyzing that all the time. That really is one of the biggest differences in today's world. And then of course there's differences in the way that we promote ourselves. Sure. Um, it used to be, everything used to be word of mouth. It was your most important uh, traffic driver. And it still is. But word of mouth means something different today than it did mm. back then. Word of mouth then was like you had a cup of coffee and do you have a, right. do you have a guy? Yeah, I got a guy. And then, you know, we would get, and we still get that. But now word of mouth is also Google reviews. <laughs> and uh, people used to use actual words with word, word of yeah. mouth. Now it's uh, now it's uh, I don't I was. How do you word that? Is that, I don't know. What's uh, the new to phrase for that? Text of mouth. No, that's not I it. don't know. I don't know. Like what, what is word Type. of mouth now is. <laughs> is reviews. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, and, you know, personal reviews are important and people will trust the advice of their friends and family, but they also will, will trust Google reviews and things sure. like that. So um, it's that has changed. How you get people in the store is different. Yeah, and certainly the, the online, I mean, again, since you worked in jewelry since the mid-90s, you certainly saw the rise of the internet and the online imp, uh, applications of it to the jewelry industry. So that's, yeah. I assume, another big wave that you kind of experienced the, the changes from uh through with your guidance quite frankly and I, <laughs> well, you didn't probably mean this to be such no, a I praise didn't. josh episode but <laughs> i did um you know you did teach me a lot about that and we rode that wave together we probably yeah. learned a lot together too yeah. uh through uh at that time it was like you know social media at that time was just facebook right and it was like okay how much do we do what do we use facebook for what do we mm -hmm. remember we did scavenger hunts and yeah. things like that we did all sorts of fun things with yeah. it uh, and, and that was now, back when the organic algorithm actually reached people who liked your page. Yeah. yeah. And we had some, some pretty crazy experiences with yeah. that. Uh, uh -huh. and then some disappointments and then we learned and then we, okay, we did this. And we, and back at, back then it was just you and me, you didn't have a whole team. Right. Uh, and it was just like, we kind of learned and, and flew along together. And, and nowadays it's, it's all about the algorithms and, the, <laughs> and a lot of stuff I don't even understand that mm. you guys teach me. Google, man. Mm -hmm. Google is a big thing as we are on Google right now. Yeah. <laughs> Google YouTube product. Thanks, Google. Um, okay. Let's let's shift a little bit to uh, you running the business, mm -hmm. uh, doing ownery things. Um, what's it like to be you? Describe a week in the life of a jewelry store owner. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. Yeah. Uh, it's I live a, a charmed and blessed life, to be honest with you. Um, I, I talk to friends sometimes who are in the industry and they'll say, they'll have kids and they'll say, well, you know, I don't, I don't, they'll say things like, I don't want my children to, to work in the business. And I'm like, why? And then they, 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 they they'll say, they'll, they'll hint at how hard they work. Hmm. And I work a lot and I, I'm sure, you know, my wife who is, is hopefully watching Carter cast episodes. I have no idea if she does or not. She fell asleep by now. <laughs> she, she, she sighed out at the beginning. Uh, <laughs> it, you know, she would probably say I work too much. I work, work too many hours. I travel too much, but I work in an industry where I get to buy and sell beautiful things to amazing people to help them sell beautiful, uh, help them celebrate beautiful events. That's not hard work. I can think of many jobs that are, are, uh, way more difficult and probably less rewarding. Hmm. Uh, and I don't mean financially rewarding. I mean emotional and the stuff that gets you up in the morning. It makes you excited to, to, to go there. Um, so in terms of what it's like. Uh, Is there a typical week like that, that you have that you're doing? Like what, what, what categories of things are you dealing with most on a weekly basis? My, as a my, jewelry store my role now, when, as you know, when I was a young man, it was all about sales. I was very, mm -hmm. I was, I, I grew up in our industry as a salesperson. Yeah. So then, uh, you know, I became you know, shifts into management. And one of the, one of the tough things to do when you have that in your personality, part of being a salesperson is not, so though sales can be a dirty word to some people, but part of being a salesperson in India, any industry is really just, I love people. That was the yeah. hard part of COVID for me was mm -hmm. not getting to see and hug my customers and, mm -hmm. and celebrate with them. That was very emotional for me. I had a very hard time with that aspect of it. So for me, <laughs> it was very hard for me to relegate myself more to the back office and see less people out front. But at some point, you've hired enough people where... I've always said and always joked that you know your business is successful when when you make yourself irrelevant. Uh, and 
I don't think I'm quite irrelevant yet, at least I hope not. I am certainly in certain roles, as we've indicated, I have Missy and I have many other people on my team who, who do things better than I do. And part of that is also the sales floor. So turning things over to, to my sales team and, and though I'm still there for clients and, and want to help many people myself, uh, a lot of times I'll turn that over to my team because my role now is bigger picture things. It's, it's literally meetings with you talking about how do we put Jack Lewis jewelers in front of as many people as possible? Because as you know, one of the things that, that we've done over the years, I think successfully, is we've transitioned in that 13 years from being just a local jewelry store to really a regional store as evidenced by the big, beautiful building that we're building. Yeah. We do draw from quite a, quite a ways away from other communities yeah. uh, that don't have a Jack Lewis Jewelers in their community. So my role in our, our, our business is bigger picture things. Sure, it's still managing uh, employees and leading people, but it's also industry-specific events mm -hmm. and speaking at, at trade shows and, and meeting people and, and creating new relationships out there for things that I can bring to our business. So it's, it's just more high level now but I'm still in the day-to-day -day things and, and, and receiving details and updates from my team. Okay. Because you, you can't just play golf every day, all the time. I you barely, to, I, honestly, truthfully, I barely play golf. You have to do something sometimes. I haven't played the, golf in about three weeks, believe it or not. Uh, and I did not play I, nearly as much this summer as I did last summer. Hence why I'm not getting any better. Also, I'm just bad at golf. <laughs> <laughs> um. So yeah, that, that that idea of you know learning that you have to delegate and and let some other people do some things. I, however, though, I, I think I mean you are the owner, and which means your voice carries power when you do choose to insert yourself. So I guess how do you gauge when to chime in and involve yourself in a situation or a decision versus just stay out of it? I remember when I became um, a CGA, Certified Gemological Appraiser, and that is a, a title. Like after that, uh, before that, I had become a, a GG or a graduate gemologist, where you take all the classes from GIA, right, and then you follow that up with the classes from AGS. And it's it's really a very high title that you can receive in our industry as a as a gemologist. And I remember John Woolman had had a party for me, and he invited uh, you know some of my friends and local people, and even uh, uh, Ruth, who was CEO of, of the American Gem Society, came from Las Vegas for my party. It was just quite an honor. And uh, I had friends that were asking me, they were walking around the cocktail party that, that night and they were saying, one of them said to me, they said, I am answering your questions, just going around about it. And they said- It's your show. They, they said, <laughs> how much did, the, <laughs> Nick is laughing off camera. <laughs> <laughs> We've talked about this, Nick. <laughs> but somebody said, how much, how much did it cost to get your GG and your CGA? Hmm. And I thought for a sec I had to think about it for a second because the answer to that question was, I didn't know. Mm. And the reason that I didn't know is because John paid for it. Mm. And I think about that a lot today, that, that like kind of brief moment where it was like, again, we talked about you know, youthful arrogance yep. where maybe I thought in that moment it was all me and I did these things. And, 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 but no. Somebody helped me get to that point. A lot of people did, quite frankly, not just John. And when you stop and think about it, I have to do the same thing now for my team. Hmm. And that's my answer to that question, yeah. is that my role now is to help them grow, hmm. to help them get accreditations, to help them learn. And yeah, they could leave and go work someplace else. But as a friend of mine said to me one time, they said, what if they don't and they stay? <laughs> And then you have a staff that doesn't know what they're talking about yeah. and doesn't know how to help customers and doesn't know the, the vernacular of what we're trying to describe to a client. Um, and so my role really is to be as hands off as possible and to chime in when absolutely necessary, but to let them learn and grow and fly the same way that somebody else did it for me. Because and sometimes that means just like me, I had to do those things on somebody else's experience and money. And I have to allow that same freedom for my team. And I hope I never forget that lesson. One of the things you said to me one time, it, 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 the reason it stuck, it, it must have been in the context of something that didn't go well or some kind of failure. But you, you said, you know. Impossible. <laughs> no, I, you said, uh, you know, one of the things you have to learn as a business owner is that you're going to have to be okay with letting other people fail with your money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's like, mm, man, because that's something that I, I don't think anybody else ever wants to do because we know we're stewards of someone else's budget. Yeah. Um, but to your point, you had kind of seen it from that other side. It's like, look, 
nobody's perfect. Some things aren't going to go well. You have to kind of be willing to accept that sometimes, I think. But yeah, and that's the yeah, the, you do have to allow people to make mistakes with your money at this stage of being a business owner. Sure. And you and now that doesn't mean you have to be um, patient enough to let them do it again. Well, no, <laughs> right. Um, sure. But you do have to follow it up with coaching and guidance and the what did we learn? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> sometimes that's over, uh, you know, some hugs and some crying and a glass of bourbon. Sure. Uh, sometimes it's uh, just sitting down at somebody's desk and not don't get me wrong. Everybody's got their moments where you're probably a little bit more harsh than you should be. But at some point, you just have to take a step back and have some patience hmm. and realize that you've hired good people and you have to let them fly. Um, I, One of my key things I look for people that, that come to work for us, and we do even say this in interviews, is I want accountability. Hmm. Don't make you'll I own up to my mistakes all the time. My fault. Didn't mean to do that. That one's on me. Don't make me chase you to get the same recognition. Yeah. Just admit it. We'll sit down and talk about it and figure it out. Um, well, let's transition to that now. So uh, we talked just talked about running the business. Let's talk about people. Um, yep. There's a lot of different groups of people that uh, a jewelry store owner interacts with. I want to tick down about five different ones here and then just ask you one by one, kind of each, uh, certain questions about each, each group. Okay. So those, those groups would be uh, industry colleagues, which I'm kind of classifying as other jewelry store owners like you. Um, industry partners, which would be jewelry brands, other vendors, uh, that, that, that part of the industry, uh, community organizations, and then uh, staff, and then customers. So let's kind of go through each of those five groups. Let's start with uh, industry colleagues, other people like yourself who own jewelry stores. How would you describe the importance of those peer-to-peer -peer relationships in the jewelry industry? Um, for me personally, uh, monumental and irreplaceable. Hmm. Most of that through the American Gem Society. And uh, I wore my Shipley pin today. That's first. Yeah. First Carter cast I've been able to, to say that I did that <laughs> on. And I'm, I alluded to it earlier, but I said that I haven't been able to watch my speech. And I truly had no idea that that, that was going to happen that day. And, and what I want to say about my time on the AGS board and, 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 you know, just the, just the freedom that even my staff allows me to go travel and do these things. And my wife, who stays home and raises our children so I can travel and do these things. And, you know, I'm thinking of this person and that person, in particular my wife, and in particular, you know, my team at Jack Lewis and all the people that helped me get there. And then all the people that, that have served on the board with me and taught me so much, much, much larger stores and much larger communities just took me under their wing and, and taught me things that I, that I could have learned no place else. And after, for about a week afterwards, dur during the, when I won it and I got up and I said, I wasn't as emotional as I ever thought it, I might be. If you were to ask me, would you, if you win a ship, leave, I thought I would be a weepy baby and I wasn't. <laughs> and, uh, but for about every, about once or twice a day for a week afterwards, I would be by myself and I would cry hmm. over the emotion of it. And, um, my wife and I were driving to an event one night and I said to her, I said, part of the gift of a, of a Shipley award is that you don't know you're going to get it. But part of the curse of a Shipley Award is that you don't know you're going to get it. <laughs> and I said, because I didn't say this about you, mm. about my wife, and I didn't say this about this person, and I didn't say this, and I didn't say this. And I was, was very emotional as I was telling her this. I was crying. I didn't even think it makes me emotional thinking about it now. And she said to me, this is evidence, by the way, that I married the right person too because she's so supportive. She said, she got real quiet for a second. She said, yes, but you're always worried about those things. Maybe just for a minute, it was about you. And um, <laughs> that's what I needed to hear in that moment because it truly was uh, being hard on myself that I didn't thank people enough. But I'm not sure how I ever could have. And so... Uh, Again, obviously, you can never say anything, uh, say enough about your own support system in your in your own home or in your own in your own team. But I also can't thank those colleagues enough that got me to that point. And um, the answer to that question is, it is uh, people who don't do that in their industry, who don't reach out and have uh, friends in their in in their field uh, that do what you do, but on a different level, on a higher level, on a lower level in a smaller town, in a bigger town, in a bigger uh, business, uh, you're really making a mistake because it's truly made all the difference in the world to me.
as evidenced by this, which is because of them. I've, I've seen you over, over 13 years, and you're, you're, every day is thinking about someone who's not yourself. You know, It's just you're thinking about other people, customers, staff, other things you have to do. And yeah, you're right that the, the curse of an award like that when you're not expecting it is that all of a sudden you have to kind of like just shut your brain off and now all of a sudden realize that, you know, the, the lights are on you for, and for you have through. to give a speech to 800 people that are your most <laughs> respected friends and colleagues, you know, and you just you want to do a good job and you want to honor them and you want to do right by them um, as you want to do every day that led, led up to that moment, of course. Yeah, it's just peer groups that I've been involved in with the other jewelry stores that we meet a couple times a year together and, you know, talk about everything and just support you support each other. It matters. Is, is there, what's the, what do you think the benefit to customers is to know that their local jewelry store is connected to other jewelry stores across the country? Th that I think should matter um, because you want to know that I'm out there researching, not just in jewelry. Sometimes we, you know, we, we throw around the word trends and you know, what's, what's for lack of a better way to put it, like what's hot. Um, we don't, not just looking at that. We, we're thinking of jewelry as, uh, as timeless. Sure, some things are trendier than other things. But to know that I'm having those conversations with other people that may have, God forbid, discovered something before me <laughs> and then learned from it, whether it be a technique or, or, or uh, something that they could do in store or product, a service, a uh, way to repair jewelry that's better or organize your shop or manage your team or give back to your community. So a lot of, a lot of our conversations are about charitable events and things that we do in our communities that matter. Yeah. Um, so yes, that should matter to know that my network is, is large and influential in my own life. Yeah. Um, brief, like a side tangent about that. So we talk about the industry, uh, people, what, what do you think the value of getting completely outside the industry perspectives is, um, like maybe mentors or trusted voices who aren't in the jewelry industry at all? Is it, what value have you found in that over the years? Yeah, I was just having this conversation last week, uh, with a friend who's in that field, uh, of connecting people with, uh, mentors that aren't in their industry. Yeah. And his point to that was it brings people, it, you bring a perspective and they don't have any of the bad habits that you could develop <laughs> in your own uh, industry and the people around you have the same bad habits maybe. Mm -hmm. So while I just said you get a lot of good ideas from those people, sometimes it becomes a little bit of an echo chamber. So to know how certain things or certain messages may be received by people who don't have jewelry as a base knowledge mm -hmm. is essential. Yeah, no, I think that's very important. And just to no, particularly locally. How is your business received? What are we known as? Uh, there's there's CEO groups of, of other business owners that get together, and I've not been a part of one for many years, but when I have been, that's been really essential. You can just say, hey, what does everybody think of this idea that I have? Yeah. And they'll say, that's terrible. <laughs> Good. That's yeah. Sometimes you need to hear that from people that aren't in your, you know, you don't need yes people in your life. That is not how you grow. There's the poll quote right there. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, all right, let's move on to industry partners. Um, so other jewelry brands, uh, industry-specific vendors. Sometimes these are people who want to sell you things or want you to sell their things, um, yeah. which can uh, create some additional stress, uh, uh, tension, if that communication is, is mismanaged. Uh, so how do you believe a jewelry store owner can effectively navigate those kinds of relationships? The first thing that you can do, and I see a lot of my, my friends, certain people have different techniques for how they handle their vendors, but Miss, one of the things that Missy and I think have ultimately in common, one of the reasons why we've meshed so well together is that vendor relationships are as important to us as our relationships with our clients. Hmm. Meaning uh, you have to have a good uh, rapport with them. You have to be able to, to there's always a, a yin and a yang and a give and a take. Um, but the word that gets thrown around so often in our industry that, that many of them, I think, and I say them because I think I've been very reflective of this in, in my life uh, as I've, I've worked with my vendors is they use the word partnership quite a bit. We mm -hmm. want to be your partner. Mm -hmm. But then when it comes time to do things for you that are that are on that partner level that a true partner would do for you, they push back on. Mm. And it's like, sometimes it's like, you know, the princess bride, like, I don't think that word means what you think it means. <laughs> um, so sometimes we have to reinforce that. And it's not just us asking for things and pounding on the table. We have certain obligations that we live up to along the way when it comes to those conversations. Maybe it's, maybe it's merchandise that we want to swap out for new merchandise. But, yep. you know, I have to be uh, honoring that partner along the way and doing what's asked of me, which I think we do a pretty good job of. And because Missy and I are both very conscientious about that. 
Um, but having vendor partners that are interested in your growth because they know that it's also good for them is really good. And then, of course, just there's so many. When I when I was on the road as a sales rep, remember back before I came back to Jack Lewis, yeah. that somebody said to me one time, an older uh, vendor said to me, he said, there's so many good people in our industry to do business with. I just don't mess with the ones that aren't. Hmm. And so it's kind of the same way with vendors. You know, we really just seek out true vendor partners. And then the minute that it kind of looks like they're not, we just, there's, there's other good people that will do that. So again, we're very blessed to have the people and the brands and the, and the quality of items that we're allowed to bring to Bloomington Normal is, uh, I think, second to none. And that's not an accident. That is years of hard work that goes behind the scenes. Uh, third group of people I wanted to hit was community organizations uh, here in, in, in local or here locally or perhaps regionally. Um, one thing that happens when you're the owner of a successful business is that organizations in the community often want to partner with you in, in some way. Um, nonprofits to business organizations, sometimes with donations, or maybe sitting on a board, uh, hosting events, your personal participation in, in their event. Um, what role do you think a jewelry store plays in maintaining relationships with community organizations like that? A jewelry store has a very special role in our community, uh, not just to celebrate and sell things uh, with people as they walk through the door, uh, but I think as anybody who lives in Bloomington Normal for sure can attest, you almost can't go to a special event in this town that's a fundraiser and not see Jack Lewis represented. We more or less donate something to every event, uh, mm -hmm. any event that asks for the most part. We, we do donate. Sometimes it's a gift card, sometimes it's a piece of jewelry, sometimes it's an experience in the store. Mm -hmm. Um, and I take that obligation very personally. That's not marketing to me. That is uh, truly helping worthwhile causes that benefit our community, hence benefits me, the people that work for me. Everybody that works for me has an individual passion about some sort of, of not-for-profit or, or some sort of aspect of our, our life that is important to them. Um, I try to honor that as much as possible. So... Uh, yeah, I think that it's it's really crucial. And so when I see these events or or people that ask for it, we just we have a pretty firm policy that we we do our very best to help everybody that asks. Yeah, yeah. Do you think it matters to to customers uh, to see their local jewelry store uh, involved with <coughs> with various community organizations? I hope that it does, but that's not why I do it. Uh, if it does, that's great. Yeah. Uh, if if you drive home from an event and you, you think to yourself, this is the 37th time this year I've seen Jack Lewis at a, at a special event. A, thank you for going to 37 special events in our community <laughs> that raise money. Uh, and B, thanks for noticing us. But again, that's not why we do it. It's, uh, it, it's not, I don't, I tr it may sound, it's easy to say, right? I don't do it to be self-serving, but I truly don't. I just, I do it because uh, every cause matters might not be like something that's on my radar, but it matters to the people that volunteer their time, talents, and treasures to do that. So I want to be a part of it. Yeah, I mean, I can certainly vouch for that, that, that you, because it, it is the, the age-old question, I suppose, that maybe people skeptically think goes on in boardrooms and conference rooms that charity is really marketing. We're really trying to get out there. And I, I appreciate you saying that it's not, because I, you know, you've never done one of those events and, and you know, sent me an email and be like, hey, get a big promotional campaign going so people know that we're supporting this event, you know, because it'll really look good for us. Like, you've never, ever done that. <laughs> and so it's, it's really it's really good to know, I think, that that it does come from, hey, guess what? You live here. You own the business here. Yeah. You want the, the town to be successful. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, it, it, the, the nuts and bolts of it are, I mean, you and I know, because we can, it can kind of in today's world look and say, hey, this ad was successful. We spent $1,000 and it brought people to the store. Yeah. If I donate a $1,000 piece of jewelry to an event, I promise you it didn't really bring people to the store. So right. there's better ways that I could do that. It, it's, if it is marketing, it's not effective marketing. So, that, <laughs> so right. It's, right. It, that's, that's, that's also why I would chalk yeah. it up as to it's not marketing. It yeah. truly is. The businesses that do it, it's not just us, by the way. There are many businesses in this town that them. I would tell you would have the same... Uh, uh, philosophy that we do is they don't, they just don't say no and they do it because it matters to them and that we all have an obligation to be here, stay here, support shop here. Yeah. Uh, and, and more, most importantly, help our charitable organizations thrive and succeed as well. Next group of people is staff. Um, your team. Oh boy. So as the, <laughs> no. as oh, oh, them, <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, as the business grows, you get to hire people. Uh, overall, staff is probably the most frequent point of contact with customers, yeah. uh, certainly as a retail jewelry store. 
They're often the most visible faces of, of your business. Um, what should customers know about how you approach the process of adding people to the team? As a, a legacy owner in our industry, uh, you know, as a business that's almost 100 years old, you, you have, you get, you inherit, as you and I've talked about this, you inherit the good and the bad of that legacy sometimes, mm. and including like maybe an, an interaction that happened in the Illinois hotel when our store was here back in the 60s. Yeah. Maybe you had somebody, some sales associate at that time that had a negative experience with somebody's grandmother, right? Like, so that you, I do still hear things mm. like that. But more, more the positives, but sometimes sure. the, the, those things. Sure. And so as we just had this, I had a meeting yesterday where we talked about this as a team. And our job as we see it, because whether we've worked there for 10 years or whether we're going to work there in another 10 years, what we're doing today, and this applies to what you're doing anywhere, but particularly when you have a public facing service uh, business like we do, what you're doing today is a part of your legacy, whether you know it or not. Mm -hmm. And so you want to, your individual legacy, not just the Jack Lewis legacy. So we want to deliver an experience that's perfect as much as we can all the time. We're never going to be perfect. We can't be perfect. We are going to make mistakes with clients. We are going to occasionally upset a client or overpromise and underdeliver. Uh, but that is not the norm. And I think that you, those, those Google reviews or, or word of mouth, whatever that looks like today, I think you'll find that about us. We go out of our way to make sure that the experience is, is positive. So I hire people that I know will deliver that experience. And if it's, Sometimes you hire somebody to be public facing and it turns out that they're not. So sometimes you find another role for, for that person in your organization. Good people are good people and you always need good people. Um, it's just, uh, it's, it's really important. Uh, you know, when you asked me earlier, what do I do every day? I yeah. might've been, been a little iffy on it because I don't do what I used to do. And the reason that I don't have to do what I used to do is because I have good people that I know will deliver a good experience when I'm not there. And that's really crucial to me being able to get away, to be able to golf badly, uh, to be able to sleep at night, and to, and to do those things to know that I have really good people that will do a good job. Not always gonna do it the way that I would do it. I don't want that. Uh, you know, I don't wanna clone myself. I want people who are better at things than I am. And I think that's really uh, been the key. Um, what, uh, what, what does, the leaders are often tasked with this, this uh, idea called creating a culture. Mm. Um, what, what do you think that looks like at a jewelry store? How, how do you approach creating a culture at Jack Lewis? Just kind of empowering your people to make decisions. I think it's the, uh, that Ritz Carlton method of their, their employees are empowered to, to accommodate clients. And so, so are mine. My, my people know that they have the freedom to, again, what we talked about earlier, to learn on the job, yeah. to make some mistakes, to know that we'll support them. Um, but to know that, uh, they have the freedom to once we have a, we have a really a pretty good training program that pairs them with more seasoned employees as a mentor on our team and so they're not really totally released into the wild until they've learned kind of our culture and the way that we want to do things but the foundation of that culture is to deliver an experience to that client every single time that makes them thrilled that they walked through our, our front door uh and I think that we hire, I mean, you're there a lot. We have, as I, and I, I tell people this when we're, when we, big personalities are going to do well in our store. We have <laughs> big personalities on our team, various versions of that. But, yeah. but you have to be, you want to be outgoing. You want to truly like people. That you helps. To, <laughs> truly liking people is a, is a key component uh, to what we do. And to be able to just have a good day, even when you're not always having a good day, uh, it makes makes all the difference in a, in a service related industry like ours. On that, when you're not always having a good day, do you have ways that you? Is there anything unique in the jewelry business about how you keep your team motivated? Food. <laughs> we feed them a lot. <laughs> that's unique to jewelry. That, yeah. That's everywhere, man. Everybody yeah. gets motivated. By Maybe that. we go out and have a drink together. Um, you know, you're doing a good job in hiring when your staff truly likes hanging out together outside of work. Uh, and I, you know, again, I, I give Missy full credit for, for bringing a, a, a good team, especially our, our most recent hires. Um, you know that you're going to have days when you have some family drama 
um, because we, that, it is a family because you spend we spend more time together probably than we do with our own family. Sadly, that's the nature of working together. Mm. Uh, and so you will have some of that, the ups and the downs. Uh, and just to know that everybody is loved and supported. And I tell them, and it's not just saying this because this is Carter cast. I want working at my business to always be that whatever is stressing you out outside of work, whether it's maybe some maybe somebody's in school, maybe they have uh, they're having family issues. Maybe they've had a death in their family or they just have something in their life, the trouble with their children or something like that. Uh, they're going to have those things that happen. I want coming into my store and signing on for your shift to be your respite from all of that. Hmm. I want you to feel loved, supported and respected. And I do think that that translates down to the to the client. They should feel that when they walk in. And as you know, Josh, when I bought the store, we didn't have the perks and the benefits and the things like that that I have for my team now when I'm able to hire and, 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 and be more competitive as an employer uh, to find good talent. Man, the day that I was able to put like insurance and retirement plans and things like that in place because my business had been successful enough to do that, like that was those were emotional days for me. That meant a lot to me because I don't, and I think maybe my team doesn't always understand if any of them have watched past this point, thank you. Um, but <laughs> Maybe they don't understand that I don't go home and just worry about my own wife and my own children. Everybody that works for me has a significant other and, and dependents and like whatever that looks like for them. I worry about that because me being successful and unlocking the front door every day that pays them matters to their families. And then it's, it's the butterfly effect, man, because it just translate down because the people that work for me also support those community events and do things and, and, and support what, what it is that we do here. And I, I just, that stuff is, you know, me, I'm overly sentimental about everything, but that's not looking at things wrongly to look at the world that way. And it's, and to know that me turning that key in the morning matters beyond that effect of that door unlocking. Lastly, customers, clients, uh, the, the last group of people that you deal with a lot. As you reflect, what, what are some of your most memorable types of moments with clients? I have emotional ones. I have uh, some I don't want to say on camera. Sure. Most, most things that we celebrate in our store are about celebrating something happy. Almost always. Almost every interaction is about engagement or birth of a child or birthday, 50th birthday or, or, or something like that, you know. But sometimes it's end of life things too. And it's those things that I think stay with me. Um, I once was able to do kind of a, a sweet home Alabama moment for, for a family with, a, with a, a mother who was very ill and we were able to open our business and surprise her and she walked in and we turned on all the lights and we were there to, to help her choose something special that, it, that her husband wanted to get her. And there were, you know, we had champagne and we had and it was just, it was this very emotional, beautiful moment that we were able to spend with a family really probably in the last few months of, of her life. That's not about money. I couldn't do that if I was in any other field, you know, and that's just, that's the big ones, let alone the fact that you get to be really the first thing that a couple does together when they want to say they're going to spend the rest of their lives together and they come see us. That's never not awesome. <laughs> that's not, that never gets lost. That's never like, woohoo, sold a diamond. That's like, congratulations, have a glass of wine, have a bourbon. Um, thank you for, for choosing us and allowing us the honor to be a part of that. So when they get to that point, though, uh, you talked a little bit about the experience today uh, with, with the, the customers. I'm curious what, what you've learned uh, from a jewelry store owner's perspective, um, what, what you can do to ensure that a first-time customer will come back and, and become a, a repeat customer. Or something more than a customer, you know? Yeah, it's, or... it's not about delivering a perfect experience every single time. I don't think that most people expect that. I think that they expect to be, we, we sell art. We work in a place that sells beautiful things. And they can walk in and see and admire. And it's not necessarily about, one of the part of our culture is creating a culture and, a, and an environment where they don't feel like they have to spend money when they walk through the door. We don't even expect that. People are probably surprised to learn that. Uh, come and get your jewelry cleaned. Give me a high five if I haven't seen you in a while or a hug or something like that. Like that's, ours is a community space, particularly when we get into the new store, right? I mean, there'll be some surprises there. Stay tuned. Um, <laughs> you know, the, we want our place of business to be an extension 
of what makes you happy. The term retail therapy exists for a reason. You walk in and you're surrounded by beautiful things. Maybe you buy things. Maybe you just try things on and you look on it, look at it in the mirror. You make a wish list. It might be a future planning thing. I turn 50 next year and this is what I really want for my 50th. And you walk around with our great team and you have a good time and a few laughs and a glass of wine. Um, that's my vision for what that is, is walk in. Yeah, we want you to spend money. Can't, can't say we don't, but we don't expect that every time. We want you to just walk in, feel loved, respected, honored, uh, because we truly are honored that you're there. Uh, and that really is comes down to just hiring good people like we talked about before. And I think that we have the team in place that delivers that pretty much every single time. On the flip side, what, what are some things that maybe you've uh, not certainly done yourself, but maybe other jewelry stores have, have done or that you've heard of that really screw it up, that can really just <laughs> is not the way to handle something or not do it this way if you want somebody to come back? Are there any like just pitfalls and landmines you learn to avoid when it comes to dealing with, with clients? Yeah, I wouldn't even pick on anybody else because I can learn from my own experiences. Um, I go back to when, again, thinking about what we were going to talk about today, I, I thought about what was I like when I, when I was younger? When I first came to Jack Lewis in that, in that 2002 uh, era, and we talk about legacy and heritage and things that we're proud of in our, in our store and in a nearly 100-year-old business. Yeah, there's so much I'm proud of. But in those days, I thought my job was to defend the integrity of my business. Sometimes where I would bluster at anybody that might dare to not acknowledge that we were so great. Mm. And what I've come to realize in my old age is that your legacy isn't about what you've done. It's about what you're doing. And I have to defend that every day. And I have to handle myself today in a way that I'm proud of, not in a way that I should be proud of from 35 years ago, before I was even there. Your legacy is something you're constantly building. Your uh, uh, reputation is something you're constantly maintaining. And that's something that I've learned it was, is, is, and I think a lot of businesses do that, is they just think, you know, you just stamp your foot on your own integrity by saying, I have integrity and we do things the right way. Well, you have to constantly do things the right way. That's not just a sometimes thing. And so sometimes, just about every uh, time I've disappointed a client, I say me, not, not, not the store, because if we do it as a store, it's me doing it. If, we, if I have disappointed a client, there's always some kernel of, of relevance and truth to what they're upset with me about. And it's how do I make that right and rebuild that relationship together uh, so they feel comfortable coming back in and giving me that high five or hug and paying uh, us the honor of coming in to uh, celebrate a happy occasion. What, what, do you, what do you want clients, what, what do you think it would be important for customers and clients to know about how you think about them? at the store, like about maybe, I don't want to say how important they are to you because that, I don't want to go to a financial point, but like, I, I just know that you guys spend a lot of time thinking about clients, how to improve their experience, how to, they're very much on, on the forefront of your guys' mind. I just want to know how you'd put it in your words about how often frequently the types of ways you think about customers that might really make an impact on them if, if they knew it. Uh, it's a constant thing. I and mean, we don't even make any inventory decisions without thinking of even, even individual customers. We'll be like, oh, this person would love this, and this person would love this. Uh, and it might be somebody who's a regular. It might be somebody that we only see every couple of years. It might be somebody who hasn't been in for a long time. So it's, it's or, hey, as we're laying out the news store and doing this, so-and-so is really going to like to you know, sit in a lounge chair and have a drink or so-and-so is going to want to sit by the fireplace or, you know, so, so, as we're laying things out that are, that are like that, we are thinking about individual customers all the time. Of course, you think about the collective customer as well. What does well in our market? I hear, I hear stores uh, so often. I was at a, uh, we were in Gulf Shores uh, this, this uh, last week uh, with our family and I, I visited a store that sells the, the wallets that we sell. Yeah. And it was this great little men's store. Uh, and I really liked it. It was just, just a fun vibe. And we got, you know, we bonded over the sacred wallets and, and she, she, I think she had told me she, they were their first one in the, in the country. I was like, well, I was their first jewelry store. So we were, you know, we had, but it, it was just the similarities in our industries of, you know, like we have a, a 
she'll say, she was saying things to me like, well, they have a certain price point that we, you know, they do well with and, and things like that. So it's like knowing your, your customer base, but also not pigeonholing your customer base. You want to be careful not to do that and say, well, people won't spend over this or they want to be under this. We want to offer a luxury experience, but we also want our place to be warm, inviting and welcoming. You don't have to spend $50,000 when you walk through the door. We're thrilled if you do. <laughs> Uh, but that is not necessarily an everyday event that happens for us. But uh, walking in feeling loved and comforted is our goal. And that's why we're always thinking about the customer. Sometimes it's specific customers. Sometimes it's collective. All right, let's pivot to the end. The uh, the wrap-up summary questions. Um, there'll be three that are kind of deep thinkers and then three that'll be just kind of fun. No-brainers. Fun no-brainers. Um, what are the most important qualities or abilities a person should have to successfully run a jewelry store? What does it take to do this well? Uh, dedication to your craft and to know that you're constantly learning. I think that's true in my business and it's true for probably just about any, any business. Um, knowing you can always be better and never resting on what you've already done. What do you wish you'd have known back in 2010 um, before you became the owner? I mean, having a heads up about COVID would have been nice. <laughs> <laughs> prep for that for a good long time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, other than that, yeah, I mean, the, the dips in the economy, you know, the, the that, what was that, 2000, well, it have been before that, but 2008, 2009, yeah. like little dips, recessions, things like that would have been awfully nice to know about ahead of time because you would have planned inventory accordingly and been a little bit more lean going into those times, been a little bit more robust coming out of those times. Be brave when you should, as Warren Buffett says, be brave when other people are fearful and be fearful fearful when other people are brave. Reading the tea leaves would, would be nice in those events. But uh, no, I just wish that having the ability to recognize talent when I see it hasn't always been uh something that that I've been aware of. I think I could, like when I meet people and, and understand that, hey, this person would be a good fit on our team, uh, but being maybe more aware and constantly on the lookout for people like that would have been something that I think I could have done a better job of over the years. Hmm. Um, because I think I've maybe missed out on some people that would have done well with us and us for them. Hmm. What are the most difficult types of decisions a jewelry store owner has to make? Learning who to say no to when you have to say no. You know me. I'm a people pleaser. I don't. I don't like no's. You're I, everybody's buddy. I'm everybody's buddy, and I like to be a problem solver. And I like to. Um, that's my role in our town, <laughs> as, as, as the owner of Jack Lewis, is to be there to help you celebrate and smile. And so the times where I have to disappoint people, it hurts. Whether it be a client, an employee, a friend, a charity, uh, we do our best to be all things, uh, but we can't. And so the times that I have to say no I'll always haunt me. Yeah. But on the flip side, what are the most rewarding parts of owning a jewelry store have you found in 13 years? Celebrating love. That's it. <laughs> in because, all its forms. Yeah. yeah, in all its forms. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I can elaborate if you would like, but it's pretty simple. It's, it's, yeah. uh, it's if we said it, you could probably make a montage clip of all the times that I've said something similar on, on this show, but... It's not something we take lightly. It's something that we wear as a badge of honor and always will. And I do think it makes us a better business to always have that be our focal point. Love. Everything is driven around love. Yeah. Sure, we want to be profitable. We want to have a place that can continually hire and grow and you know offer a good home to employees and, and it's a thing that we can give back to our community. Uh, but, but celebrating love is definitely the best part of what we do. It's almost like love means everything. <laughs> hashtag <laughs> always the marketer it's almost like the slogan came from somewhere from you uh, <clears throat> well uh, from listening to you uh what's a good piece of advice you received that has stuck with you maybe in your capacity as a business owner as a jewelry store owner i don't know if it's a piece of advice i received from anybody that i can recall uh specifically saying it but it's 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 lead in a way in which you would follow someone else if someone else were to lead in the way that I were to lead, would I follow them? Would I want to be a part of what they're creating? Um, that I can't say that I got those that in those words from people, but I learned it by example from everybody who ever took me under their wing. And it, really the advice in there is to always be a mentor. 
always find yourself in a position where you can mentor somebody about something. Uh, I have had dozens and dozens of mentors in my life. Uh, and they all, as I said earlier, they all came along at a time in which I needed them. And you do uh, undersell yourself sometimes by thinking, I'm young, I'm inexperienced in my field, I can't mentor. You can always mentor somebody. And be on the lookout for that and be willing to do it. Because I can promise you that like of the mentors that I've had in my life, if I'm even a tenth as influential to them as my mentors have been to me, it, it, it's so rewarding. And the other thing that gets lost is every time I've been a mentor to somebody, I learn so much from them. And so being a mentor is, is, is key, I think, to cultivating you as a person and you as a business owner. Last question. Um, there are a lot of types of businesses a person could own. Uh, in fact, some people are serial entrepreneurs, uh, bounce from business to business because it's more about the, maybe the leadership skills they think transfer from industry to industry and, and what they're doing might almost be secondary to, to some people who do that. But what is it about a jewelry store that makes it a unique experience for you to own that kind of a business? I love the humbling nature of our business. Um, I, so often we've, we've hired salespeople that, you know, they just, I, a term that I hear from salespeople a lot is, I can sell anything. I can sell widgets, I can sell cars, I can sell jewelry. Ice to an Eskimo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> jewelry is not that way. Uh, because there's a lot to learn. You have to be, you have to understand sometimes the science behind what we do. You have to understand the emotional you have to understand pricing. You have to understand the difference between a red spinel and a ruby uh, and why one is significantly more expensive than the other and be able to explain that in a way that's honest. Uh, and so I like that humbling nature behind what we do. And then sometimes you see somebody and you're like, okay, you know, it was very humbling. And then they come in and they really excel. That's even better. You know, that's, that's even more rewarding to, to have it not, not take you know, a lifetime to learn as it's taken me a little bit of a slow learner. Uh, and so that, that really has been um, one of the more rewarding things. And one of the things that I think is best, but really just in terms of it, it comes back to, I can't think of any industry where relationships are as much a part of what we do as it is in the jewelry business. Uh, I think that I could think of lots of different products, like from cars to food to everything else that you maybe, you probably don't see the person as often, and you just certainly don't see them for things as monumental as we do. And so to be always on the forefront of being one of the people they get to celebrate with is everything to what we do. Maybe it's relationships mean everything, Josh, <laughs> always to always be on brand. Uh, but for me personally, that's, that's truly the best part of our uh, role in this world. You're almost 50 coming up by the time this airs you'll you'll be 50 you coming to my party it will have happened i didn't know there was a party what maybe no you've rsvp'd maybe there's a maybe there's a party right now we actually have a surprise uh, what we have a we have a surprise that is entering from uh stage whatever that is uh to to say celebrations and thank yous for what you've done oh uh. <laughs> i guess are we gonna sing happy birthday to you Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to Carter. Happy birthday to you. Can you see that? Can you get that on the camera? <laughs> hey! Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Absolutely. It's been, um, a good, been a ride. Yeah. Couldn't have done it. Our success at Jack Lewis has so much to do with Joshua 1-9, your team, uh, Nick, who doesn't wear shoes when he records. Um, Sarah, always give me a hard time. Jess, of course. Jamie, thank you, everybody, for everything you do for us. Um, it's been, uh, it's so nice to partner with people that truly uh, get us, uh, me personally. And you, you've had to manage me so much over the years. And you do such a, a good job with this and always setting us up for good conversations. So thank you to everybody here. You bet, man. Love you guys. Uh, thanks for watching. This is our last episode of the year. Probably like a season finale kind of vibe to this episode. Yeah, because This is probably enough. Because the people have had plenty. Well, I said season finale, not series. Oh, enough, because oh. the next time you see us, there will be big announcements. Dragons. 
Oh, oh, a dragon. Oh, I oh. thought we were gonna do like a House of Dragons. Thing. <laughs> Maybe the cliffhanger of the, yeah. the news, the new season premiere. Uh, there'll be big news, uh, big announcements to share. It'll all be very exciting. Uh, there were some teasers in this episode. There were, there yeah. were some, uh, and then a, a whole new season will begin, um, as we talked about earlier. Yeah. So that's it. Thanks for watching the Cartercast. Cast.